This Week in Virology, the podcast about viruses, the kind that make you sick. From Microbe TV, this is TWIV, This Week in Virology, a special episode recorded on September 23rd, 2019. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you are listening to the podcast all about viruses. Today, we are recording at the Prometheus Annual Meeting. You'll find out what that is in a few moments. We are at a conference center in Briarcliff Manor, New York. It's the Edith Macy Conference Center. And we are not too far from the home of the Clintons. Did you know that? Yeah. Not too far away, in Chappaqua. And my guests today are members of Prometheus. Let me introduce them to you here on my left from Albert Einstein College of Medicine, Kartik Chandran. Welcome. Hey, Vincent. Great to be on. I have to take it back. <laughs> <laughs> and you guys have one down there you can pass along. Okay, next to Kartik from MAP. Biopharmaceutical, which is in San Diego. Zachary Bornholt, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. A very famous company. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Next to him from the University of New Mexico in Albuquerque, Stephen Bradfute. Yep, welcome. Is that the way, <laughs> right way to say it, Bradfute? Bradfute, yeah. Very, I was impressed. Usually I have to you know, correct, but not this time. Your colleagues are all laughing. We don't know why. They laugh at me out. a lot. It happens. They do? Yeah. yeah. Next to him from the U.S. Army Medical Research Institute of Infectious Diseases, which we know, fondly know as U.S. AMRID. That's in Fort Detrick in Frederick, Maryland. John Dye, welcome. Hello, Vincent. You get the prize for having the longest place of work. Good acronyms, yes. I don't know if it's good or bad anyway. Next to him from Umeå University in Sweden, Matthias Forsell. Welcome. Thank you. Umeå? Umeå. 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 I work very hard on my Swedish. I got smugen right where, yes. where I was uh, last month. Uh, I can say Karolinska. That's easy. <laughs> Umeå. Okay. And next to him, he's back for his second time, University of Texas, Austin, Jason McClellan. Welcome. Thank you, Vincent, for having me. Great to be back. Pleasure. I should say that uh, this is Kartik's third time. How about that? Here on TWIV. <laughs> I'm coming back. Don't worry. <laughs> Next to Jason from Adimab, which is in Lebanon, New Hampshire, Laura Walker. Welcome. Thanks, Vincent. Did I say the name right? Adimab? Adimab. Adimab. Real yeah. quickly, right? Adimab. What is it? it? I know MAB is monoclonal antibody. What's the A? That's not actually what it stands for in this case. No, it doesn't? No. It kind of does. Be what does easy. the whole name stand for? Then? I don't know, actually. <laughs> I know it's not monoclonal antibody. It's, manufacturing and something. Everyone thinks it's monoclonals, right? I know, yeah. Oh, okay. My apologies. <laughs> and finally, from the Universidad del Desarrollo in Santiago, Chile, Cecilia Vial. Hi. Welcome. <laughs> Did I say your name right? Vial? Yes. I bet a lot correct. of people say Vial, right? Exactly. Americans in particular, right? Yes. Yeah, we don't know how to pronounce anything. <laughs> except. But you, you say it right. Vial. Vial. Thank yeah. you. Welcome all. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about uh, what, what's Prometheus and what you do. We have an audience here of people, I guess you do the work, right? <laughs> and they just take the money or direct you or something. But uh, welcome to you as well. And we're, we're going to find out a little bit about um, what kind of work goes on here. But first, I want to ask each one of you your path to getting where you are today. You know the drill, Kartik. You've already done this. In fact, I'm going to skip you. Because everyone knows you so well, we don't need to know. Uh, but we will we'll start. I want to know where you were educated and trained and and so forth to get to this point. So so let's start with you. Um, like starting in grad Zachary. school? Zachary. Or all the way where, back. Where are you from? <laughs> where are you from originally? Uh, originally in California, uh, Los Angeles, near Hermosa Beach. You didn't wander far, did you? Well, I went to Texas for a little while. That was fun. <laughs> okay. Experienced the South and then came back. Where'd you go to college? Uh, I went to college at UC Davis. Okay. California, yeah. And then PhD? 
Uh, Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. And what did you work on there? I worked on the structure of the non-structural protein one of influenza virus. Mm -hmm. uh, Who was that with? Dr. Bidadi Prasad. Mm -hmm. um, sure. And I worked with him uh, for a number of years and then went to Scripps after that to do my postdoc uh, with Dr. Eric Holman Sapphire. Mm -hmm. uh, worked on a number of Ebola virus proteins. And then that's actually how Laura and I met. Uh, and then we've kind of transitioned that now from Scripps, took the tools that I learned there to move to MAP to help build antiviral therapeutics. So can you remember how far back in your life you wanted to be a scientist? Uh, yeah, it was my freshman year in college when I discovered I probably was not going to go to medical school. So. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, yeah, the, I remember that distinctively, actually, because I wanted to be a neurosurgeon. Mm -hmm. And then I had two introductory college courses at the same time. One was the introduction to neuroscience, and one was the introduction to microbiology and the natural history of infectious diseases. And... I walked out of the neuroscience class after the fourth or fifth time they had me draw the spinal column. Um, and I was like, this is way too boring. <laughs> I, just, I changed my major the next day. And, and that's it. It's microbiology ever since. Okay. So at um, MAP, Biopharmaceutical, what do you do there? Uh, I'm not sure anymore. But no, it's uh, like you said, um, we do a lot of antigen engineering, so development of soluble viral proteins to use as bait to discover novel and potent broadly neutralizing antibodies or therapeutic antibody candidates um, for primarily neglected tropical diseases. Mm -hmm. um, I like to tell the joke that we're a company that specializes in commercially non-viable products. Um, we're entirely government contract and grant funded, so uh, we don't have any private money. Um, coming into the company. So we pretty much fulfill the needs of the, you know, the NIH, WHO, Department of Defense. Uh, that's what we prioritize in our pipeline. Do you do any lab work yourself? Uh, not as much as I used to. Every once in a while, I'll get out there and get made fun of. Um, but otherwise, no, I don't, I don't get to do as much as, as I used to. I, I always ask that question, and I asked someone recently, do you pipette anymore? And they said, no, we have robots. <laughs> Which is not what I meant, but I don't get to do that. <laughs> okay, can you pass that on yeah. to Stephen? Stephen, uh, where are you from? Portales, New Mexico. It's a little town on the New Mexico West Texas border. Mm hmm. Did you, and I guess you went to high school there, right? Went to high school there, went to undergraduate there at Eastern New Mexico University. Wow. And tell, don't tell me you got your PhD there as well. No, they did not have a PhD program, which is why I left, and I did my PhD at Baylor College of Medicine in Houston. You didn't overlap, did you? A bit. We did. Yeah. With le what lab were you in? Peggy Goodell's lab. Mm -hmm. I worked on uh, using adenovirus to transiently express genes in hematopoietic stem cells and studied how that affected um, their differentiation. Okay. And then I presume you went on to do a postdoc? I postdoced at uh, USAMRID, and that's where... Met, uh, John and I met. I worked on um, immunity against uh, hemorrhagic fever viruses, uh, mostly Ebola, but also some Marburg and some of the uh, uh, New World Arena viruses as well. You didn't work with him, did you? Yeah. 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 I'm starting to see a pattern in this consortium, <laughs> Kartik. Uh, and um, do you remember when you wanted to do science? Yeah, I think it was uh, in college, um, in undergrad, I was double majoring in history and political science because I wanted to be a lawyer, and I realized I wasn't enjoying political science, and I thought, well, I like biology, so I'll just major in that and then go to law school. Mm -hmm. and then I took uh, immunology class, and uh, that from there on out, I pretty much uh, decided that's what I wanted to do. And do you pipette anymore? No, uh, the last time I tried, my tech kicked me out and made me go back to the office and write more grants. So those days are done. So you have an academic lab, right? Yes. You do research. Uh, you write grants and get the lab funded. Typical, right? Yep. Do some teaching as well. Okay. John, where are you from? So I grew up in a military family, so we moved all over the place all the time. But I was born in California, and then we moved every three years. So I got real good at uh, making new friends, hopefully. 
We're enemies. <laughs> did you go to some interesting places? We did. We lived in Ramstein, Germany. Uh, so Bowling Air Force Base, um, Alabama. I did, yeah, it was a lot of moving. So, Where did you go to college? I went to the College of William and Mary in Williamsburg, Virginia. So, and what you what you major in there? Just biology degree, uh, general BS. And uh, <laughs> after that, I had no idea what I wanted to do when I became an adult. And uh, I basically um, put together a resume and blasted the Northern Virginia, Washington D.C., Maryland area with my CV. And I got a job doing HIV research. Uh, I was a blood jockey. They would send in blood from Walter Reed and other places for HIV trials, and I would pull off the lymphocytes and set up MT2 assays and all kinds of different things like that. And after I did that for four years and realized there was a glass ceiling above me, I decided to go back to grad school. And I went to Loyola University in Chicago, uh, working in the lab of Dan Quinn. Uh, we did chemokines and chemokine receptors that were important for CD8 and CD4 T cell migration in the brain in a multiple sclerosis model. That was a postdoc, you said, right? No, that was my graduate Grad degree. student. Where did you postdoc? And then uh, I got a job as a postdoc at USAMRD. And then once they train you at USAMRD to work in BSL-3, BSL-4, they try to retain you as much as possible unless you disappeared in New Mexico. Uh, and I've stayed there since. Do you remember when you wanted to do science? Was it in college also? No, it was actually in, uh, in high school. In my senior year of high school, I took AP Biology. And I knew that was what I really wanted to do, but I didn't know what exactly I wanted to do at that time. Okay. Do you still pipette? No, not at all. Uh, when I go overseas, when we go to Africa and do collections, mm -hmm. I don't have a choice, but they normally just make fun of me while I do it. Okay. So you, you're, you have a lab which is a basic science lab. You're an immunologist, I guess. I'm an immunologist by training. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a basic science component of our lab, but we also have a more deliverable product-driven component of our lab as well. I like to say our lab is that transition point from basic science all the way up to right when you hand it over for phase one clinical trials. So more of the spectrum of what uh, what we can do. And we should point out your your lab is in the Army, right? Correct. Yes. So I we work for the U.S. Army, for the Department of Defense, but I'm not in the military. Uh, after being in the military with my father traveling all over, I didn't want to join the military. So this was a perfect way for me to serve my country at the same time and not have to move every three years. So are you a contractor, basically? I'm a GS civilian. Yeah. Okay, got it. But you have a good military haircut, right? No, thank you, sir. <laughs> Okay, uh, Matthias, I know you're from Sweden, right? Yes. What I'm part, where did you grow up? So I grew up in a town called Skellefteå, which is 150 miles north of Umeå. Okay. Uh, so I actually did my undergrad studies in Umeå. And then I went to the Karolinska and NIH and studied uh, HIV vaccines. Uh, that was what we were working on. So at Karolinska, I worked with uh, Professor Gunilla Carlson hedestam and then at NIH, I was with uh, Richard White, and we did a lot of structure-based design of vaccines uh, to look at if we could elicit broadly neutralizing antibodies against HIV. Uh, and then I, I kind of guess I, I became a little bit disillusionized about the whole HIV vaccine uh, field. It was exceedingly difficult, so I started studying more how B cells actually recognize proteins. Uh, and I did that at, at uh, mainly at the Karolinska, going back. And then I actually moved back to Umeå uh, four years ago uh, and kind of switched from small animal models to more human B cell immunology. Uh, and that's when I came there, I kind of wanted to, uh, I guess, use the HIV fields you know, cloning of antibodies to superimpose that on the HFRS virus we have in endemic in Sweden. So I contacted Klaus Halm and looked at their uh, um, patient cohort and we looked at blood samples from there. And that's, we ran into Kartik and, and uh, Rohit at the meeting and now we're here. So you have an academic lab, you support it through grants, right? Yes. 
and yeah. you're focused on immunology immunology problems, right? Yes. I mean, partially this hantavirus research, yeah. but also main, uh, basic B-cell research. Do you go in the lab yourself and, and do some experiments? Uh, not really. I mean, when they, <laughs> so when they need help to make single cell suspensions, yeah. that's when I go in and like, I can mush things up. <laughs> that's, I can that's mush what things. I do. That's great. Very I'm good. not allowed in there otherwise, I think. <laughs> Okay. Jason, yeah. where are you from? Texas? No, I'm from uh, southeast Michigan, right outside Detroit, 8 Mile. It's close to Ann Arbor, <laughs> right? It's like an hour and a half from Ann Arbor. Oh, really? I mean, I'm very close to Detroit. Yeah, about okay, because when I land at Detroit, it's not a bad ride to Ann Arbor typically, right? Yeah, no, th that's fine. Okay. Yeah. Did you, and where'd you go undergrad? Uh, undergrad, I went to Wayne State, which is in mm -hmm. Detroit. Uh, yeah, basically got a full ride to go there. My parents said you're going there, and <laughs> it, it was good. Uh, you know, it's like 40,000 students, a lot of good science going on there. Uh, so my first year, I got recruited into an organic chemistry lab. So I was an organic chemist for three years before realizing everything smells and might kill you. Uh, <laughs> and then I wanted to do something more and like, uh, I, took, I took some graduate level uh, biochemistry courses and realized like enzymes are pushing electrons and doing everything. Uh, and so I, I really like that. So my last year I did some uh, protein biochemistry, worked with some archaeal proteins, loved it because you just boiled the, the, the lysate and that was the only protein that survived. All the E. coli <laughs> proteins crashed out and like this, this is good, good living. And um, where'd you go to grad school? Grad school, I went to Johns Hopkins School of Medicine. And so I joined, uh, I rotated through three different biophysics labs and then uh, joined Dr. Daniel Leahy's lab, the x-ray crystallographer, worked on a lot of uh, extracellular receptor ligand interactions, I think most famous for a lot of the, the work on uh, the EGFR and the, the HER family of proteins. I work primarily on the, the hedgehog signal transduction pathway. So we were able to determine some structures of uh, hedgehog and sonic hedgehog uh, bound to a new family of co-receptors identified by uh, Phil Beachy's lab when he was still there. Uh, so that was really interesting, kind of more basic science, and then I really wanted to do something more translational. Uh, so I thought about synthetic biology for a bit, but realized I still loved structural biology. Uh, and so we became attracted to um, some of the work that was going on at the Vaccine Research Center, where I met Matthias, where uh, Peter Kwong's lab was trying to do structure-based vaccine design. So that, I thought, gave a nice way of determining structures, but then using the structural information to try and engineer uh, antigens. So I was in Peter's lab, but then also worked with Dr. Barney Graham, I uh, did a lot of work on both HIV and respiratory syncytial virus. And that was a postdoc, right? That was my postdoc, yep. And you went to Austin right after that? No, then I started my lab at Dartmouth College in 2013 and was there for four years and then moved to UT Austin January of last year. So we've been there a little less than, than two years. Right, and you were on TWIV last July. We were July. on TWIV last year when you came to Austin for the 500, 500. episode, the big one. That's right, Yeah, that's right. So apparently you have to be on three times before I excuse you from... That's what I was wondering, yeah. Because <laughs> so I don't remember. This is remember. my last time. This is my last life story. So next time you don't have to tell your life story. Do you still uh, do research in the lab yourself? Let's see. My contribution to the lab is primarily in the structure determination pathway. Uh -huh. So uh, I think for structural biologists, the only way to get good is to determine a lot of structures. And so I've determined more structures than everybody else. So if they get stuck on something, I can come in and, and help build or I process a lot of the cryo-EM data. Uh, so I don't do much of the pipetting, but I'm very involved in, in the structure determination, whether it's by x-ray or single particle cryo. So you do exclusively cryo-EM in your no, lab? No, I'm trained as a crystallographer and we moved to UT Austin to have access to these uh, new microscopes. Mm -hmm. And so now the lab is about 50-50 single particle cryo and x-ray. Um, it just depends on the size of the protein and some other things. Uh, but yeah, we've had a good year. A number of new cryo-EM structures have come out and x-ray structures. So we're doing about 50-50 right now. And I think we'll keep doing mm -hmm. that for the okay. foreseeable future. All right, Laura, where are you from? Providence, Rhode Island. Oh, you didn't stray far, right? Um, no, I went to University of Wisconsin-Madison for college, though, and then San Diego for graduate school, and now I'm back. You're back in the Northeast. Um, where did you, when in your life did you get interested in science? When I was three. What did you do? I don't know. That's what my mom says. She has a little book of quotes, and there's a <laughs> quote saying, I want to be a science guy, and I don't know why I wanted to be a guy, but... 
That's, <laughs> that's great. what I said. My dad was a scientist, so I kind of grew up in a lab. Well, that's, that does it, yeah. So when you went to Wisconsin, you, you were a science major. Yes, I took almost exclusively, just got myself into a program where all I did was science classes. I got out of all the humanities and majored in biochemistry. I worked in a crystallography lab, Ivan Raymond's lab, working on kinesin motor proteins, and very quickly realized I didn't want to sit in a cold room all day flipping cover slips. No offense, Jason. We don't do that Not anymore. that you guys do that anymore. <laughs> the robots. It's yeah. all robots now. It's all robots. Um, and so when I went to graduate school, I decided to work on infectious disease. Mm -hmm. um, that was in San Diego, you said? Yeah, at the Scripps Research Institute. I was in Dennis Burton's lab, and we worked on uh, the identification and characterization of broadly neutralizing antibodies to HIV mm -hmm. and vaccine design. Common theme. And that's what got you interested in antibodies, I guess, right? Yes. And so that was your PhD, you said, or postdoc? I forgot now. That was during my PhD. Right. And then I did a very short stint at UCSF in a very basic B cell biology lab where we kind of just did imaging all day. Mm -hmm. And then at some point, um, I realized I wanted to do more translational work and not write grants all day. So that's when I jumped to industry to Adamab. Okay, so what do you do at Adamab on a daily basis? I sit in meetings all day. You sit in meetings, okay. <laughs> That's like academia. <laughs> so you don't pipette anymore either, right? No, but probably about two years ago, I still did some stuff. So Yeah. How long have you been at Adamab? Seven years. Okay. Um, do you miss not pipetting at all? No. <laughs> but you don't like sitting in meetings, do you? <laughs> no, no, I guess I don't like anything. <laughs> you don't like, okay. Uh, so you, just to return to something before, Adamab, you don't know what it means, right? I don't. Okay. It means something, but I can't remember because we never talk about it. All right, work. no problem. Cecilia, you're from Chile, right? Yes. You were born and raised there. Yes, in Santiago. And you still, and you work there still, right? Uh, yes. So where did you go to college? In Santiago. Santiago. Universidad Católica. It's Catholic University. And were you a science major? Uh, yes, I, I was a biology so already you were interested in science when you went to college. Yes, exactly. So, did you, were you so we don't have college there, so you just enter a career path right away, first year. Mm -hmm. So it, I just entered biology. So you, were, you entered biology to be a, what, have a career in biology of in some kind? science, right? yeah. Okay. And uh, then you got a PhD, I presume, right? Exactly. Where? Same university. The same university. <laughs> yeah. Okay. And uh, who, what research did you do for that? Um, it was completely different because it was uh, cellular biology in Duchenne muscular dystrophy. Okay. So completely different from Not microbiology. Viruses, yeah. yeah. Did you do a postdoc? Um, mostly, yeah. What I uh, mostly liked was uh, genetics and genomics. So yeah, I um, started on doing that. Mm -hmm. And then... Um, I started on hantavirus because they wanted to sequence the virus and then I started working with Pablo and Greg Mertz and I think through Greg is that I get in here. So at some point you got a position at the Desarrollo, right? Yes. And so you have your own lab where you do independent research there. So you're an academic scientist, right? You have to raise grant money in Chile, I guess, right? Exactly. Same thing. Is it, <laughs> so is it, it's is it just really hard? Being, um, yeah. It's, I think it's the same as here. Mm -hmm. Like the, you have to postulate to grants. So that's what you do. Stay okay. in an office yeah, and write. Yeah, sure. Do you work in the lab yourself? Not much. Not much? Yeah. You, stay in, you go to meetings? Go to meetings, write grants, yeah. papers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so that is uh, the Prometheus team. So let's, um, right, Kartik? I'm going to give you the mic. That's the, and so... We also have a band. It's the, you have a band? It's a metal band. No, we should, though. We really should. Because so, it's a good name for a band. All right, so let's explore Prometheus. So this is some kind of grant mechanism. Can you explain that? What it yeah, is. so it's a it's a U nineteen uh, NIH grant, and it's uh, basically a cooperative translational award. Um, the it was a solicitation to develop. Um, it focused on developing therapeutics against um, sort of um, neglected pathogens that were on 
um, the, the select agent list, which is this list of important sort of uh, highly virulent pathogens that um, the US government is interested in developing treatments against. And um, so we basically chose to work on two emerging Bunya viruses, um, one rodent-born, um, one group of viruses, the rodent-born viruses, the hunter viruses, and another Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus that's a tick-born um, virus. And sort of, you know, I think there are various reasons why we, we sort of converged on these, but it, it definitely did seem that going forward with climate change and a lot of the disruptions that may be coming um, as the, the ranges of these hosts and vectors changes, as agricultural patterns change, we're going to see more and more um, of these kinds of infections, of zoonotic infections jumping, you know, from uh, jumping from animals to people. Um, and I think the other that that was sort of a big part of it. And we also had the tools, I think, as a group to to kind of tackle this. And the way the group came together was also pretty organic um, to to kind of work on on these problems. Because you have to share the mic, I can take it away from you anytime I want. All right, so what, why Prometheus? Well, first of all, you're the PI, right? Is there a co-PI as well? No, just you. So this was your brainchild? Can I get the mic? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I, would, I think it was, um, we already had a group of people that were working together. So, um, you know, we're working with John and Zach and, um, you know, Laura um, on developing antibodies for Ebola, again, with a very similar approach of, uh, identifying, discovering uh, antibodies uh, in, in humans, from humans, and then developing them into therapeutic. And it, this seemed to be an extension. So I think we knew the solicitation was coming out. So we had a conversation where, like, we should apply. And um, I think we did eeny, miny, eeny, meeny, miny mode to figure out who is going to be the PI. And, uh, but it made sense to, for it to be an academic. Uh, I think it was musical chairs. So whoever is left standing at the end got to be the PI. Um, but yeah, um, it was, we wanted an academic uh, lead. Anyway, sorry. I'm just kidding. It's okay. Um, well, if you renew it, maybe you could make someone else the PI next time. Never happened, right? It's a lot of work. They're not yeah, renewable. To Too that. much work? They don't, they're not renewable. Oh. They're not renewable. Okay. It's a one year, it's sort of five year term and that's it. Five years. Okay. What, what, what does Prometheus mean? Is this your idea? Prometheus? The, the name Prometheus? Actually, it isn't. So we, the, a similar band of folks with slightly overlapping group, we, uh, we put in a DARPA proposal, um, to do, which is based on the same sort of similar lines. And the guy who was leading it, who is not in this group anymore, <laughs> actually came up with Prometheus. And, you know, we, I just thought it was a great name, you know, um, bringing fire to the people and that sort of thing. Um, it just seemed like, you know, because we could call ourselves U U19, blah, 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 but that's kind of lame. You need a good name, and Prometheus seemed like a good name. And so it was good, actually... Uh, good logo? And, and, you know, we have a cool logo to go with it, so... Yeah, I noticed that. You have a logo, but nobody's wearing T-shirts with the bloody logo. What's the story? You can't afford them. You can't afford them? All right, we should make T-shirts next time. It's good. I mean, good. We, or hoodies. Need more or hoodies swag. or mugs or whatever. Um, yeah, U19 is pretty... Bland. So I thought for this uh, episode, you know, we have a lot of listeners who are not scientists, and you're using their tax dollars, right? So I thought you could explain what it is that each of you are doing. You already stated kind of the overall goal to to get people who are sick with these infections get their B cells, right? Make monoclonals and maybe develop those into therapeutics. So maybe we could go around and. Um, and see what each of you does in this puzzle, right? And you again, you pick these because they are. Well, you you tell us why did you pick these two classes of uh, pathogens? Um, I mean, we picked them because a there's not that much out there for them in terms of treatments. B, um, you know, tick-borne infections are on the rise, and um, with hantaviruses, which are rodent-borne, there are so many different hantaviruses and different hosts that have been that haven't been shown to cause human infections yet, but they could in the future. So these just seem to be uh, two groups of viruses that have the potential to, to jump into humans, and they were relatively understudied. So I think for, for us, you know, we could have done Ebola, we could have done Marburg, you know, we could have done arena viruses. It was, we were also looking at the landscape of who is, you know, 
who else is working on these, these pathogens? And it seemed to us that these were relatively uncovered by other groups. So it seemed, you know, why are we all just doing Ebola? I mean, it, we should spread out because there are a lot of other emerging viruses that we should be concerned about. So how, do you, how does this work? Do you pitch an idea to NIH or do they uh, tell you what they want or is it a combination of the two? Um, I, I, it's basically they have a list of things that are responsive. So we need to pick uh, at least one pathogen from this list. Um, and then, you know, in that particular solicitation, vaccine proposals weren't responsive, if I remember correctly. So it had to be some kind of a therapeutic approach. Um, and it needed to be very driven towards translation. It needed the goal of this, of Prometheus, of all of these U19s that have been funded is to, is to generate, is the deliverable is a product or at least something that's moving towards a product rather than just research and publication. So that's been made clear and it's been repeated to us over and over again that the goal of this isn't just, it's, this is not an R01 grant. I mean, the goal of this isn't just to do research, it's to actually move us towards development of a product. So as long as we meet those criteria. Uh, by the way, we, um... Two episodes ago, we talked with um, Ali Mirazimi in, at the Karolinska about Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever virus. He, he runs the BSL-4 there. Probably most of you know of him. So we talked a little bit about that. All right. So I guess this all starts with sick people. So uh, among you, who gets the sick people? You do. Okay. Give him a mic here. <laughs> Steve. So in, uh, in New Mexico, we have the highest number of uh, Sinombre hantavirus patients um, historically um, in the country. So we get uh, patients coming to the hospital, the University of New Mexico Hospital. And um, in our protocol also, we can get patients that have come through uh, maybe other hospitals, and we can collect samples from them, track immune responses. Okay, so you, you get the, the hantavirus patients, and presumably you already have acquired a number, right? Correct. Then you do you purify the B cells or does someone else do that? So we take the PBMCs, we ship them to Adimab. Okay, and you 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 work with the blood cells yourselves, right? Yes. And then they ship the antibodies back to us and to John and to others, and then we test them for a neutralizing activity against uh, the, the viruses. So you culture the B cells and have them. Yeah, give her a mic. Tell us what you do exactly. To a scientist or non-scientist. Non-scientist. Non okay, so we take the, well, they've already purified the, the PBMCs for us, which are just immune cells in the blood. Right. And then we isolate B cells, and those B cells are stained with a fluorescently labeled antigen, which is the protein of interest on the surface of the virus. And then there are antibodies on the surface of the B cell in the form of what's called a B cell receptor. So the, antigens will the antigen is going to bind to uh, B cells that are specific for that antigen. So in this case, it would be hantavirus-specific B cells or Crimean Congo-specific B cells. And we can visualize that on flow cytometry because it's fluorescently labeled. And then we can single cell sort the antigen-specific B cells into 96 well plates or 384 well plates, and then amplify the antibody genes, or heavy and light chain variable genes, by single cell PCR. So now we have the native heavy and light chain pairing, and then those are cloned into our highly engineered strain of yeast, which can um, express the fully human antibody. And then we purify the antibody and characterize. So you're just looking for antibodies that will bind the viral protein. You have no information about the activity of those antibodies, right? Not at the time that we're sorting on flow. We just know that they bind. Okay. And so once you've made antibody, then you ship them back for... So we typically do binding studies to confirm that they actually okay. bind the antigen that we sorted with. And then typically we do some epitope mapping and some what we call developability assays for poly non-specificity and things like that. And then you send them back to Steve. Who... The neutralization, we first usually send them to Cardi. Yeah. So and then you... they go to John later. And they go to me. This is a real team. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah, with both of the viruses, um, so we have these assays where we can, so these are, um, the reason why we're, we're working on these viruses and we're funded to work on them is because they're high biocontainment agents. Um, but it's pretty cumbersome to screen hundreds of antibodies for neutralization or the ability of the antibody to bind the virus and block infection. It's cumbersome to screen those in a high containment lab. Um, from the get-go. So basically, we are like this in intermediate step where 
we have these assays, and our favorite is to take VSV, a vesicular stromatitis virus, which is this bullet-shaped cattle virus um, that we can grow safely and work with in the lab. We can engineer it to express these same surface antigens of these different viruses. And VSV is now using these antigens to actually infect the cell. So the antibodies that bind um, to the antigens on the surface of this VSV in such a way as, uh, as to block infection, um, we will identify those as neutralizing antibodies. And so we're able to, um, to screen through hundreds of these antibodies uh, with high throughput assay because um, we, these viruses, we can engineer them with all kinds of bells and whistles so we can include um, a label inside the virus, um, which actually, for, for um, some of the, for hantaviruses, we can actually, uh, Laura's team is using the VSV that has the label on the inside and the antigen on the outside to actually fish out the B cells of interest. So using those viruses as bait. And we use the same viruses to find the antibodies that are neutralizing. And once you do that, then we can give um, Stephen, uh, John, and, and, and Matthias um, a short list that they can then test using the real deal, the real viruses, to confirm that these antibodies are actually what we, we think they are. And then, and then we kind of work co collaboratively to also understand, and with Jason and others, to really understand how these antibodies work. And then with Laura to maybe find, you know, to find ways to make them even better. And then, of course, you know, on from there. OK, so for the, for the Hanta viruses, you do the neutralization in the BSL-4, I presume, right? Correct. So, yeah, so we do the neutralization assays uh, as well as other effector function assays, looking for how those, but it's really, it's really imperative that we have that down selector screening process that occurs right, before because right. we don't have the bandwidth to do the numbers that they initially do with the VSV. Got it. So. Got it. And Matthias, you also do some hantavirus newts in yes. Sweden as well? We do, yeah. So the, we're using the Pumula virus, which is actually a BSL-2 in Sweden. BSL-2? Yeah, it's BSL-3 in, in the US, I think. Well, you know, when it crosses the Atlantic, it changes. Yeah, exactly. I'm, and we're a little bit tougher than other people. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, but we're also, we're also going to do the, the more... Uh, we're actually focusing on the old world hantaviruses, so we're going to work in BSL-3 as well to look at Hantan and, mm -hmm. and other viruses. And what about the other of your viruses, CCHFV? Who gets the patients? You, so that, that would be us. So um, my team at USAMR has had a collaboration with the Ugandan Virus Research Institute in Entebbe, Uganda, with Dr. Julius Lutwama and the late Dr. Leslie Lobel. So for the last seven years, we've been traveling to Uganda to do collections from filovirus survivors, Marburg, Sudan, Bundibujo virus looking at their immune repertoire, long, mm -hmm. longitudinal studies. And uh, when you go to Uganda, you learn that it is a petri dish of every infectious disease you could probably want to find or not want to find. Uh, but for us, it's just a beautiful place to visit as well as a wonderful place to get our emerging infectious diseases. So we have an open protocol to allow us to collect from uh, patients that have had febrile illness. Uh, and so we've been collecting from Crimean Congo hemorrhagic fever survivors for the last two, three years. And we've been going back getting those samples. And then we do exactly as Stephen said, we collect those lymphocytes. We look to see uh, in the serum of the, those patients, what the neutralizing titer is, we kind of try to give them a priority list of who they may be able to get the best antibodies from. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we ship it to Adimab, and they go through that sorting process that Laura so beautifully described. And then the antibodies come back to us in BSL-4, where we do our, mi our micro-neutralization assay and follow it up with the animal models. So, Laura, when you receive these bloods from... Uganda from patients. What do you have to do with them? Is there anything special I to give them straight to Anna? <laughs> I don't touch those. Okay. <laughs> she's in the uh, meeting. So. She's in yeah my group, but she's at the meeting. Um, no, you no, were in the meeting when it comes. Right. We <laughs> we don't do anything special. We just we just sort them. I don't know if we should be doing something special now. So so these are all collected from healthy individuals. 
So they have... Oh, they were uh, infected many years before. Exactly. Okay. So we're talking, Got we it. have multiple PCR results that they're clear of the infection. We, uh, we do it at hospitals and they are in the hospitals. They're coming back from their homes to, add, mm -hmm, to have mm -hmm. those collections. So it would be just like the American Red Cross collecting from someone here. So those are uh, safe samples that are then shipped back here uh, and, and passed on. It's good to know. You're welcome. <laughs> as far as you know, they're healthy, right? As far as you know. I mean, as healthy as anyone would be that donates here. If someone is sick, we don't, we don't collect from them. If someone has any sort of illness, we don't collect from them because we don't know what that illness is. Got it. It's not our job to figure out what that illness is. Steve. Right. And, and Cecilia also with the Andes virus samples they collect from patients before sending. She's got a lovely PCR assay to make sure they're nice and negative. Yep. So, yeah, take all the precautions we can. So what... What's your contribution to this early part of the project, Cecilia? So we're enrolling patients, uh, survivors from Andes virus. That's okay. the one we have in Chile and Argentina. Mm -hmm. um, and we just uh, sent our first two blood samples to Laura like two weeks ago. So we're just starting this. Okay. And the process, you go through the same process same that you've process. described to derive monoclonals. And then when they get... Uh, these antibodies, uh, will you get them and then do in vitro neutralization assays? Is that the plan? Yeah, we, we have the BSV um, assay also, so we can try them all there. Right. Can you also work with the, the Andes virus itself in your lab? Not in our lab, but in Santiago there's a BSL-3 lab that we have access to, okay. so we could do that also. Maybe yeah. we should go to Sweden. Maybe it would be BSL-2 there. That's a little bit far. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it is far. Yes, yes. Um, and um, Zachary, what, we haven't heard from you. What is, what is your part of this puzzle? And we'll hear from you too, Jason. We're together, kind of. We're, yeah. we're, pro we're Project 2 uh, co-leads, I guess. Yeah, we kind of have a split role uh, where we both are, are doing a lot with, because we're both crystallographers. Well, I'm an ex-crystallographer now. You're never an ex-crystallographer. It's, like, <laughs> it's like a marine. Yeah. It's crystallographer so you can for see life. when you go to sleep. Um, but yeah, it's, so we specialize a lot in, in protein engineering. Uh, and that was kind of the department that we opened at MAP that I, I lead is essentially designing antigens for the specific purpose of isolating very uh, potent therapeutic antibodies from human PBMCs. So what you know, Laura's using to label the, the B cells, um, those are the proteins that, that Jason and I both have played a role in engineering and making mm -hmm. and uh, ensuring that they're properly folded and representing what's actually on the surface of the virus as accurately as we can so that we are pulling out B cells that are targeting very unique epitopes that completely impede the virus's ability to infect human cells. Um, and sort of at the other part of our role, that was MAP as a whole, who and Larry Zeitlin, uh, my boss, uh, essentially heads up is um, the manufacturing core. So once we get to our lead candidate selection, we then initiate um, a lot of developability assessments. Uh, we remove sequence liabilities and we work with Adimab on that quite a bit. They point out things that we should take a look at um, in the antibodies that could impact our ability to make grams, kilograms, you know, hundreds and hundreds mm -hmm. of grams oh, of so antibody. You have, you have the production capability yeah, so then to we do GMP production. We don't do GMP, but okay. uh, we do, um, it, you know, pretty close to GLP manufacturing. Definitely to support uh, animal studies through phase one clinical trials, mm -hmm. at least. Do you also do production in, at high levels that you would use for these kinds of studies? or No. Aren't the... the um our yeast produced antibodies is only it research small scale for neutralization assays okay. basically yeah got it another characterization so is it a um, goal after the five years to have one or more antibodies which are ready for phase one have gone already through preclinical animal studies um so we're um budgeted to to have at least one non-human primate um, proof of concept study uh, in the five years. Um, so uh, certainly for one of the, the projects, the, for the, one of the groups of viruses, 
our goal is to to have a, <clears throat> a lead candidate that actually works in a in, in a large animal or at least an animal model that you know could could kind of prepare us for for human um, clinical studies um, for safety. So that that's sort of the it's not clear if we have all the resources to do all of the preclinical work. Probably not, right? But you know, we, our goal is to get as close as we can. So what, what what do you need? I don't know who to ask this of. Maybe maybe Zachary. Exactly. How many animal models do you need to submit to FDA? Do you need one or two? Uh, it, it depends on what's available. Uh, if the FDA ideally would love to have two proof of concept animal models that represent the human course of disease, um, but you know according to the animal rule sort of guidance of the FDA, if there's one animal model that has been approved, I mean, that, that's sufficient to move forward with. So one thing I just wanted to mention and, and you know, to format to these guys, but to talk about is just, we also picked two viruses that are more challenging than some of the other options on the table in terms of animal models. And so we may have, you know, great antibodies, but the question is, you know, we're realizing that we need to do some animal model development in parallel um, as we're moving forward. So I can pass this on to Matthias and John to talk about more. <laughs> you can start. Yeah, okay. <laughs> no, we're, we're uh, actually, <laughs> We're actually exploring an option to use actually the natural host of the the Pumla virus, mm -hmm. the uh, yeah the virus that's endemic in Sweden and Finland actually, to see if we can use that as a challenge model at least as a proof of concept that we can protect against infection. So they're actually chronically infected these bank valves. So um, I think it's a high bar for them to clear the infection once they're infected, but I think we have a good shot at at least testing if the antibodies can can protect them from the infection. And we're also exploring mouse models. And this is actually done in collaboration with Thomas Tradin at uh, the University of Helsinki. So the bank voles are the natural host. Do you breed them or do you just capture them? Uh, we actually have a collaborator in Germany that, that breeds them as well. Okay, so, so they're, un they're uninfected presumably, right? Yes, yes. I mean, we can catch them in the wild. But it's just we have to screen them for the virus first then. It's a very tedious process. So right now we're, we're going to get them from, from Germany, actually. So you, you take these naive bank voles, you infect them, and they become chronically infected, you said, right? Yes. And they don't have disease symptoms? Um, no. So you would test a monoclonal to be able just to prevent infection? Yes, or in those. Or maybe that, resolve it at some point as well, right? I mean, that, that is the question. I mean, the bank voles actually do elicit antibodies against the virus. So you don't really find much virus in circulation. So it's all in tissues. So I, I would guess that the antibody response that they naturally make mm. probably clears the virus. But, you know, we can always infuse the antibodies before a challenge and see if we can okay. reduce the infection. Can you talk about CCHFV models? Sure. So, uh, so there are multiple models that are out there. Uh, to be honest, they all require work is the best way to put it. Uh, so there are rodent models that are available that we can use uh, that are decent, but the question remains whether they are actually good surrogates for the human disease uh, because of differing differing results that occur from different laboratories. So we're in the process of working those models. And then we also, there is a non-human primate model in Sinos that has been moved forward uh, in Rocky Mountain Laboratories and other places. But that model is very uh, immature at this stage and a lot more work needs to be done, I would say. Um, so animal model development, uh, it's great to have the product and be ready to go. But if you don't have all the accompanying assays and the animal models to move them into, it becomes very difficult. So I think that is probably a large hurdle that this group is going to have to overcome, uh, which is we can only take it so far and without having those animal models in place. So, but that's a large portion of this project as well. So this has been in existence for one year, is that right, roughly? And apparently you've got 
monoclonals for both viruses already. I've seen being presented here, being tested already. So that's good progress. But in, in terms of that, I wanted to ask you, I don't know who should answer this, but um, I learned from the Ebola situation that you don't always want a neutralizing monoclonal antibody. Sometimes a non-neutralizing one will have effector functions in an animal. And I think this is fascinating because I was raised and trained as a virologist. The neutralization assay in cells was the gold standard, right, for serum and then monoclonals. But you miss a lot when you don't go into an animal because there are other properties of the antibodies that can resolve an infection and they don't neutralize in cell culture. So if you are screening for neutralization, how do you are you interested in those, or if so, how are you going to pick them up? Who's, who can answer that? Everybody could answer if you want. Jason, anyone? Or Zach? Or? <laughs> uh, I mean, I could complicate that even further for sure, you sure. and <laughs> say that there's different even categories of neutralizing antibodies. Yeah. Some that act through the law of mass action, you know, those antibodies that block receptor binding. So you have antibodies now that are competing with the virus for you know, a receptor in the human body. They have other antibodies that block fusion, and they aren't necessarily bound by the laws of mass action. You don't need to outcompete anything. And those are maybe the antibodies that we're trying to pursue more and as far as a therapeutic is concerned. I think that, and this is my personal opinion, that non-neutralizing antibodies are a very valuable part of the human immune response, but when we're developing a therapeutic, we're, we're trying to take one single component of a, a very polyclonal response and convert it into a medicine. And I think the best route forward, and you guys can feel free to argue with me about this, I love talking about it, but is that you take those effector functions that we know are important and graft them onto these neutralizing antibodies. And we've become very good at this through manipulating the FC region of the antibodies, and this is one thing that we do do at MAP. Um, we work very much with Galit Alter's laboratory and, and Bonnie uh, Gunn, who works there, uh, analyzing our antibodies with different glycosylations, so changing the sugars that get put on the FC region to further amplify these neutralizing antibodies effector functions. Various mutations, point mutations we can add also, you know, like to say turn these antibodies up to 11, right? You get your neutralizing components on the variable regions and then you crank up the FC region to match what you might see from a non-neutralizing antibody onto a neutralizing antibody. And um, that's when I think you get really that, that level of potency where you've moved into an actual cure or medicine similar to, you know, I think that's kind of the so, ultimate goal. But if you look for neutralizing only, you're going to miss the others, right? Are you trying to deal with that or not? Um, I mean, we've focused on primarily on neutralizers. That's our down select. And I guess like Zach said, our goal is to take those neutralizers, make them better as neutralizers, but also add on, you know, and so certainly with the, the work that we've done with, you know, with this group has done with Ebola, you know, we started with neutralizers and then by adding on effective function optimization, uh, we can make those antibodies even better. Um, and also even with neutralization, by combining antibodies, so with our, we have this two antibody cocktail for, that's a pan Ebola virus, um, there, you know, potential therapeutic for against all Ebola viruses. And there you have two different antibodies that work really well together. Um, and they, um, they um, afford, you know, multiple advantages, including it, it seems anyway that um, it's harder to get, you know, a resistance beyond the fact that you have two, two antibodies. So where the presence of one antibody actually, you know, if you do get resistance to the other, it, it seems to sensitize the virus to the first antibody. So there are some kind of advantages of combining antibodies as well, um, both from a neutralization and potentially from an FC effector standpoint. I also want to add that uh, Galit Alter and Bonnie Gunn um, at Reagan Institute are also part of our consortium. And, um, you know, we you know, have explicitly kind of proposed to look at the effective functions, but we, we're not, I guess we've sort of decided as a group to not spend huge amounts of time on characterizing non-neutralizers from the outset beyond just understanding where they bind on the virus. So. I'd like to hear from Jason what uh, you're doing on this project. 
should be green when it's on, right? In there. There we go. Yeah, so uh, part of the project too, primarily our contribution is in structural biology. So as the antibodies are generated and characterized for their uh, various binding properties, we can then determine high resolution structures of where on the antigen these antibodies bind. This can provide insights into their mechanism, which we can then test. Uh, we get a sense of perhaps, uh, you know, by defining the exact epitope, how uh, conserved the epitope is, whether it's possible resistance might occur there. In theory, we could use some of the structural information to then try and optimize the antibody to better bind or uh, to either increase affinity and potency or for breadth to try and hit some of the different strains of these. Uh, so that's our primary contribution. We also do a, a variety of uh, biophysical uh, characterizations with uh, different binding affinities and competition. And then we do some antigen design, uh, both to try and help assist with the structure determination, but then that can also be used for probes. So you, um, you you look at structures of the select antibodies, not all of them, obviously. Not all right? of them, that's right, yeah. And with purified proteins, with pseudotyped, I guess, because you can't use the native viruses, uh, right? Yeah, yeah uh, purified recombinant proteins. Just recombinant, not the pseudotype virus particle. We have sort of to take a look at like the VSVs that are displaying hantavirus GN and GC, yeah. and that's been a pretty interesting way uh, to verify that the GNGC organization on the VSV variants that were used for uh, probe selection match what's been seen on the surface of actual uh, hantavirus variants. So um, that's been something uh, pretty interesting as well. So the uh, VSV glycoprotein is pretty much spread all over the particle. VSVG right? From, right. from all prior studies appears to be uh, uh, well distributed across the in entire viral envelope. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, and if you make a pseudotype, is that the case for all other glycoproteins that you put on there? Not for all the various glycoproteins that we've looked at. That's very interesting, right? It is very interesting and suggests membrane curvature or some other physical property of the, the yeah. variant shape could impact the localization of the glycoproteins. Yeah, that would, be, that would be interesting to sort out and see if there's a protein determinant of that or Yeah, or and something. It can it be, could yeah. it be modified and tweaked? Uh, VSV is used now uh, for a variety of uh, vaccine antigens and sure. clinical trials. I'm not sure how well characterized those are uh, at the molecular level. And could you start to influence either the density of spikes per variant or the distribution of spikes? So I think you're kind of uh, opening up some of this uh, rational design uh, type of approach to the vaccine and antibody development. Yeah, the, the Ebola, one of the Ebola vaccines is a VSV That's right. glycoprotein that uh, is being used in Congo right now, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So can you figure out from what you're doing also the mechanism of uh, neutralization, which Zachary was alluding to? Yeah, exactly. Before. We think uh, you know, part of hypothesis generating. So from yeah. the structures, we can generate hypotheses as to how these are working, which then allow us to uh, develop assays to then biochemically uh, determine that. And so I think, I think Maybe Cartex Lab will be doing most of the, the, the mechanism for the neutralization, but uh, clearly it looks like we have at least two, three different classes of antibodies, and, and based on the structures of two of them now, we have a good sense for how they're preventing fusion, working at different steps, it can explain synergy. Uh, and so I think that can be also be helpful for down selection and development of cocktails rather than just single antibodies going forward. Yeah, I was just gonna, you just brought that up at the perfect time, because I was gonna say too that I think one of the, 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 the sort of the back and forth between this structure and the mechanistic assays is really a really cool feature of the stuff that we're starting to do, the work that we're starting to do, because, you know, like Jason, you said, it not only informs picking which antibodies and understanding why certain combinations work better than others, but I think there's also like, although this is a translational project, there's also like a, a basic research bonus, I think, that comes out of it, which is that we understand, you know, in more fundamental ways in which these glycoproteins work, in which antibodies prevent infection, and maybe, you know, be, that's not our part of our like scope of work, but that could be potentially used to design vaccines or just to kind of understand the natural biology of the, these agents and how, you know, hosts develop, you know, immunity to them or develop an immune response. I mean, it's really interesting to wonder why bank rolls, which mount an immune response to these viruses, you know aren't able to clear this disinfection. I'm sure that has to do, it's complicated and has to do with manipulation of 
various cell subsets and immune responses and things like that. But you know, does the antibody response, the nature of it, have have something to do with it or not? I feel like there's a basic research bonus that also comes out of this work, uh, in addition to the us hopefully getting closer to the translational goals. Yeah, I mean, antibodies are terrific research tools that have uh, really advanced many different fields of infectious disease. And so you can use them in different assays to determine which conformation a protein is in, or as it processes from a pre-fusion to a post-fusion, uh, you can use it to halt an assay at a certain point. It's a it's really fantastic research tools, in addition to their, their power for uh, vaccine development and development of the antibody themselves as a prophylactic or therapeutic. Uh, I would add also that the the development of these antibodies can also lead to really great diagnostic tools as well. Uh, a lot of these viruses and the different strains and isolates don't have specific antibody antigen complexes that allow a determination of exactly what it is. So I think that in effect, an added benefit on top of this will be that there's a giant toolbox of diagnostic antibodies that are available for the community in order to develop and move forward to better determine what the infecting agent is. So do you, from what you've learned so far, do you have any sense for whether you'll be able to find broadly neutralizing antibodies? Because there are lots of hantaviruses, right? You've talked about Pumala and Andes, but can you find one Na uh, ma Mab to kill them all, like the ring. One ring. <laughs> <laughs> Who wants to? Laura? Yeah, Laura. I think from a sequence alignment perspective and looking at the diversity, uh -huh. we should be able to. Okay. Uh, it, it might just be more of a practical matter of being able to screen through enough antibodies to identify the relatively rare needle in a haystack. But based on uh, other fields, HIV, influenza, I think, I think it's doable theoretically. I think the caveat to that is that with HIV and flu and RSV, there's a selection for breadth because you're, infe you're either infected with an evolving virus like HIV or you're serially infected, like with flu or RSV. And so over time, you get a selection for antibodies that are broad, just based on known immunological mechanisms to focus the response. For these viruses, we're looking at a primary infection. And so it becomes kind of a question of immunodominance. So looking for the, there might be you know, a needle in the haystack, but in a way, we're kind of hoping to get lucky. Okay. So, so one aspect of this issue that struck me is that um, for, for, HI, for respiratory syncytial virus, the BNABs are encoded in the germline, which is amazing, means they've been assaulting humans and their ancestors for many years. HIV, they're not because it's brand new. Only one subset of, the, of all the antibodies that that target the RSVF pro protein. Yes, one, are but they're there. They're in the germline. They right? are. They are there. And the HIV none, right? Is that true, Laura? Isn't there HIV none? That HIV none. Yeah. Not in the, not completely germline. Okay. How about, There's some that are relatively close to germline from infants, from Julie Overbow, though. What about the antibodies you've looked at so far? Any of them encoded in the germline? So again, these are from a primary infection, and so typically we'll see lower levels of somatic hypermutation than what you see, for example, with RSV or flu or HIV. Some of them have low levels of somatic mutation. I don't know if we have any that are completely germline. We also haven't tried to revert any back to the unmutated common ancestor to see if the mutations are important or not. Okay. So another broad question I wonder if we could discuss. Um, you know, when we're infected, we make a polyclonal response. And there are lots and lots of specificities. So you want to do one or two or maybe three. Is that realistic? Or should you be making it way more complicated than that? Who wants to? I think you only need to look at the successes recently in HIV and Ebola, where even a single antibody for Ebola and two or three antibodies for HIV are sufficient to reduce viral loads down to undetectable levels. And so I think there's precedence for using single antibodies or cocktails. So those are the two best examples, Those are the two, right? I think those are the only two examples in humans. If you look at NHPs, you could include Lassa virus as well. Okay. Now, I was always struck by the fact that, you know, we use uh, antibody prophylaxis for rabies, but it's a, it's a polyclonal human serum. Why don't... And you, and there you, now is a cocktail for rabies. There is. It's approved. Mm -hmm. uh, I forgot the company. Uh, it's called Rabies Mabs or something. It's okay. the Serum Institute of India. Yeah, there are patents now on highly specific medical antibodies against Rabies G. Okay. So it's just... 
if you already have something that works, there's not much of an incentive to develop something. Yeah, absolutely. But, absolutely. So, but I think your question is good uh, because if something comes out of the woods that we're not familiar with or don't have monoclonal antibodies, you can go for a family and try to find something. But mm -hmm. so I think that there is still room in the field for uh, plasma transfer, uh, fractionated IgG transfer from a convalescent patient into an individual. Uh, because in many cases in some of these countries where these outbreaks are occurring, that may be the only option they have. Uh, they're not going to be able to get a monoclonal antibody cocktail either because of cost or because of location in time to actually develop that. So while I'm a big fan of monoclonal antibodies and cocktails of monoclonals, I think there still needs to be room in the field for that concept of a polyclonal uh, response. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> so in Chile, we use um, passive immune transfer as um, standard uh, treatment for AMDES virus uh, infected patients. So now the health department has a bank of uh, immune plasma from survivors. But still, um, you, you have to be in... Um, chasing these survivors all around the country. So to have a more uh, a monoclonal antibody that will be more uh, specific and you know how it works, like we think should be better than be chasing survivors all around. The well, you could do what they do for rabies. You just immunize yeah. volunteers with a vaccine. So you'd have to make you have to make the vaccine. Something then. that gives you an appropriate <laughs> response. So that's a lot of work as well. Yeah. yeah. So maybe chasing people is, is, not, bad. <laughs> is not so bad after all. <laughs> it's a pretty long country, though. Yeah, <laughs> so yeah, yeah. I also think it's somewhat of a matter of potency. Like if you look at HIV, the, earth, the first generation broadly neutralizing antibodies showed no therapeutic efficacy in humans. It wasn't until the antibodies became 10, 100 times more potent that we started to see this. And, and this might be the same for hantaviruses as well. So you say they became more potent? People isolated more and more potent antibodies. So okay. the antibodies now that are in people that are showing very good efficacy, therapeutic efficacy are about 100 times more potent than the first generation antibodies. Okay. And that seems to have been what's made the difference. And do those potencies, are they initially measured by in vitro neutralization? In a neutralization assay. And for HIV, there's an extremely good correlation between neutralization and protection, okay. which has been shown recently. I just want to add that you know, we're studying agents where there's a single protein on the surface of the particle of the virus that we're going after. But we start talking about viruses that have many you know, surface proteins, or you're talking about bacteria or you know, parasites or other things, or you're trying to develop a treatment for snake bite. I mean, where there are many, the snake is injecting like 15 things, and you've got to like have antibodies targeting. Maybe their polyclomics you know, is sort of like the the first thing to go for. But, but even there, we wonder if like oligoclonal solutions exist that you could, you could develop. And I guess the advantage of this is that you, don't, you can just stockpile the antibody and have it um, manufactured rather than chasing people to get you know, anti-sera. I mean, I know with snake bite, this is a big issue. It's very expensive. Um, if you get you know, bitten by a rattlesnake or something, I think Larry Zeitman could talk more about this. But there just seem to be more you know, it's not that easy to, to actually get access to those treatments in a timely manner if you've been bitten. So not sure having the monoclons is going to be that much. You know, there's still the access and delivery and all of those kind of issues. But it does seem like being able to produce large amounts of a therapeutic um, that isn't ha doesn't have to be made in a person is, you know, has some advantages. Well, as Laura said, it, it works for two other viruses. So it's likely to work for these as well. Uh, I think one of the interesting questions, so maybe you don't need to replicate the polyclonal repertoire, although you will learn that, right? Because you presumably study individuals in detail as to their response against these viruses, right? So if you have one person, you know, all the anti-pumula or whatever antibodies that person makes. So you can get an approximation of the diversity and how that affects neutralization. So you, you will have the information for reconstructing it if you want it. Right, and that's something, Laura, you could speak to about just looking at the repertoire of antibodies that are Yeah, so what out. we do is we isolate 
typically over 100 antibodies per patient. And so we get basically a snapshot of the repertoire. We can't get the whole repertoire. You'd have to get a lot more blood for that. But we at least get a snapshot so we can see which epitopes are immunodominant. So 100, what fraction of the total antivirus, like one you do virus? The mass, if you assume, say, 1% yeah. of class, which B cells are antigen specific, they're 10 to the ninth B, well, 10 to the 11th B cells in a person. Yeah, yeah. yeah so. so if you... Um, if you do 100 and you get 100 antibodies, do you ever see the same one twice, or they all 100 are different? During a primary infection, we don't see much in terms of what we call clonal expansion. So we don't think in terms, every antibody is typically unique because they're at least different by somatic hypermutation. Um, but if you look at lineages, you can sometimes see a few expanded lineages, but it's nothing compared to what you see, for example, with influenza or RSV, where you get much more expansion because of a boosting of that response over okay. time. So um, do you think we've presented a compelling use of taxpayer money? Is there something we're missing? Because people will listen. And here in the U.S. in particular, they may say, why do I care about these viruses? You know, uh, frankly, the only reason people got excited about Ebola is because it came into this country. Zika was being imported and people got – but, you know, the U.S. tends to be very – parochial about its its uh, support of infections. So what can we tell people? Well, I said it, developing these interventions is a, a long process, and yeah. you don't want to start at the moment there's an outbreak. Um, you'd much rather be prepared ahead of time and have things stockpiled for when it eventually does occur. So what you learn can be applied to any virus. Is that fair to say? Um, broadly, but specifically for these viruses, uh, we want to have interventions already in hand, potentially stockpiled for potential outbreaks of hantavirus and uh, CCHFV. And and with globalization and travel as it is now, you're a very quick flight from many of these infectious diseases coming to the United States. So I like to think of it that there used to be your backyard and my backyard, and don't worry about over there. Everybody's in one backyard now. We have to start looking at it globally, and if we don't look at it globally, we're going to be caught in a very bad situation. So the emerging infectious diseases are not going to go away. As you continue destroying ecosystems and deforestation, you're going to see more and more infringement on civilization, societies. So I look at it that it's only going to continue and get more pronounced than it has been in the past. The other thing to consider as well is that we're trying to develop pan, you know, ideally pan virus family antibodies. You can imagine, remember the SARS outbreak, if somebody had developed a pan coronavirus antibodies, we could have, you know, treated the MERS patient. Or with Zika, if someone had a pan dengue antibodies, if those those had been developed, you know, so that's kind of what we're trying to do as well. That brings up the question I meant to answer earlier. You probably don't know the answer yet, but how soon after someone is infected with your viruses of interest, would your therapy be effective? And if you don't know, how do you figure that out? I guess you need an animal model, right? Yeah, so it it really kind of depends on the virus. Um, For example, with I know with Andy's virus um, studies, I think with uh, with Pablo Vial and, and, and Greg Mertz, and I think Cecilia as well, that you can, because it's spread person to person, you can detect viral antigen a couple of weeks before you get uh, or, or, I mean, the viral genomes a couple of weeks before you actually get symptoms. So in something like that, it can be very useful. Um, I think some preliminary data from the plasma, um, convalescent plasma studies show that it is effective even when they come to the hospital and they're very sick. But I think it also depends a lot on the virus that you're looking at. And so part of the, I think that's something that should come out from these studies and especially the animal, animal models, as you mentioned, is, is when is it going to be effective? Um, I, I think also that, I mean, when patients come into the hospital, if they have not developed antibodies by then, uh, that's actually a good indicator that you would try to give a treatment because these patients actually are worse off from the disease, whether it's old world or new world hantaviruses. So I think there's probably good biomarkers to kind of predict who you should treat as well. And I would say with the monoclonal and polyclonal antibodies that are ongoing right now in the DRC, that you have individuals that are very sick that are coming into a situation where uh, they're receiving this treatment, and that's a very short time course 
where you have to intervene. A lot of these viruses we're looking at now actually are have a longer time course and more time for intervention. I would say Ebola is at one end of the spectrum where you got to get in quick, as opposed to some of these that we're looking at now. It's a little more protracted, so you have a little little more time to uh, to initiate that treatment. Hopefully. So, so these therapies that you're developing would have to be given intravenously, I presume, right? Uh, I mean, that, that depends. Uh, <laughs> currently, yes, that is the, the current route of administration for, I believe, almost all these immunotherapeutics. Um, one of the goals that I'll talk about this evening is, is moving on to, to second, possibly third generation immunotherapeutics, where we're going to begin looking at whether we can effectively deliver these antibodies because we've engineered their FC regions, we've added the FC effector functions, we've looked at the structures, we've leveraged all of our virology knowledge to select these antibodies and make them do very specific things to, to boost the potency so high that we can start to deliver them via IM injection, um, which will allow us to look more at, I think, moving into immunoprophylaxis and into therapeutics um, that could function as both a, both a prophylactic a post-exposure prophylactic and as a therapeutic through an IM injection and allow us to show up and just kill an outbreak. You just give everybody an IM injection, the chain of transmission is immediately halted, and that's the end of it. Um, and it, it's kind of a model that we're starting to explore more as we start to be able to isolate and identify these more potent antibodies that we can convert into therapeutics. Could you deliver them via vectors, the genes themselves, by a viral vector? Yeah. I was actually just going to okay. chime in about that. So also as part of our, our group um, is uh, David Weiner's group at uh, Wistar Institute, um, who essentially, and Ami Patel, is a scientist in his lab, and she'll be talking later um, about how they can encode these antibodies in DNA molecules and essentially electroporate them into muscle and therefore get long-lived sort of expression of these antibodies, and there you're thinking about it more from a preventive prophylactic sort of situation where you're blurring the line between what a drug is and what a vaccine is. And so, you know, I think what Zach's talking about, about that sort of modality could also be really useful. Um, you know, one could argue that if you're trying to do ring vaccination during an outbreak, you could also do ring DMAB or, you know, sort of uh, injection to provide this this depot of DNA that can express antibodies in the blood. And this is, you know, something that's, I think, going to grow and become more, used more. So do you want to add something about that? Uh, I mean, that's, yeah, I think that's where we're headed is, you know, getting away with using less and less antibody because they're becoming so potent and well-engineered that we can begin to explore these things and get efficacy where through different means that are, more rapidly disseminable and things like that. Um, I guess there, there's one other thing I just wanted to build a little bit on, you know, the use of the taxpayer money and why do people care about CCHF. And, um, you know, I'd mentioned that ZMAP was born out of a room probably very much like this one with a grant and a contract before anybody cared about Ebola virus. But it was there at a point where we could use it when it was needed. And that's what I think we're trying to position ourselves to be in more moving forward. Um, so it's just something to keep yeah. in mind. That's a good point. I, not too long ago, I did a TWIV with uh, the lady who um, directed the VSV Ebola vaccine in West Africa trial. Uh, Kini is her name, Kini. And she was very proud of the fact that they tested this vaccine during an outbreak. But of course, it was already developed many years before. Because the military had decided they needed an Ebola vaccine, right? So that's more evidence that you need to do these things ahead of time. Yep. Yeah, right. There's one more aspect I wanted to ask you about. And I, I understand that you can modify monoclonal so they'll last longer in the bloodstream and so forth. Is that part of this uh, research group as well? And that's exactly what the, that sort of third generation is starting to incorporate, which will bring forward that immunoprophylaxis component. Because um, the, the one advantage to that that immunoprophylaxis will have over a vaccine is instantaneous immunity. So you don't have a lag period. You don't have to wait for the human body to respond to the vaccine immunogen. Mm -hmm. You're providing instantaneous immunity. 
And that, that is explicitly built into Prometheus. So we do have, com we have components to FC, optimize the FC region of the antibody, not just for effector functions, but also for half-life and um, these other, to generate antibodies that hang around a lot longer and therefore could be used in a prophylactic setting. I'm curious as to why each one of you joined uh, this consortium. Cecilia, why did you join this Prometheus? Um, well, a uh, hantavirus infection in Chile is a um, health, a public health problem because it's you always have cases of young people. The average age is like 33, and it has a really high case fatality rate. So yeah, it's an important issue for our country. So okay, how about you, Laura? Yeah, as Kardik mentioned, we were sort of working on all of this before the consortium. So I don't. At least for myself, I didn't feel like I was joining something. I, yeah. okay. I just kind of was here. <laughs> so I, I meant to ask you, Zachary said that his company runs mainly on contracts. Is that also the case with uh, Adamab? No. At Adamab, we work mostly with pharmaceutical companies, mostly on immuno-oncology targets. Okay. All the antiviral stuff is sort of my side research interest that Adamab allows me to do. Jason, why did you join this group? Yeah, the, the goal of my research lab is to use structural biology to uh, improve human health, uh, trying to use rational design and development of antigens, antibodies, small molecules. Uh, and so this is a perfect opportunity to do that. I've already worked with uh, Laura previously when I was at Dartmouth, met Kartik, uh, seemed like a good guy. So, you know, you don't want to jump at all the Emphasis opportunities. On seam, eh? Yeah, I mean, still, I'm still, you know, testing out Kartik, making sure he's okay. <laughs> Uh, but it's actually a good, it's a good group of people that have all had success previously doing something similar. And I think that that's exciting. So uh, we know that our efforts uh, won't be wasted and we're likely to actually end up uh, developing the products, which is, which is the goal. And that's really exciting. Matthias? Yeah, I was, I mean, I joined Umeå University about four, I guess four and a half, four years ago. And this was kind of my goal to make these kind of antibodies. And then, you know, we bumped into Cardiac and yeah, he seemed like a nice guy. Seemed. <laughs> I mean, we don't know yet, but yeah, no, he's a nice guy. And then I figured that, I mean, you had, there was all this, this amazing consortia already being formed. And I mean, why not? If, you know, if you can't win, you join them, yeah. right? <laughs> if, you keep, if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> that's, yeah, that's the thing. Okay. No. John? Uh, so... I was working with Kardik and, and Matt Bio and Larry and Zach well before this, so it was a logical uh, component for me to move into this area. But working for the for the U.S. Army and the Department of Defense, developing a translational product is really where we're supposed to be, and that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do with NIH dollars in the past. So this is a great opportunity for translational research to occur and I get to play with all my friends. So it works out really well. I mean, pl part of the, the Army's interest is to protect service people, right? Correct. So this fits perfectly into that. Exactly, right? so we, we have to offer, we, we owe it to our service members to offer them treatments and uh, pre-exposure options when we are sending them, sending them into areas where this is endemic. Right. So right. Uh, it is first and foremost, and as you said, Honestly, if the U.S. military hadn't been working on monoclonal antibodies, because ZMAP actually was funded by U.S. military, as well as the VSV vaccine and other vaccines, I don't know whether we would be as far along in what occurred in West Africa and now what is occurring in the DRC. That's an arguable point, mm -hmm. but uh, I think that we hope that the products that we help develop with the U.S. Army and the DOD have a more global impact, and I think we're seeing that. And that, as a scientist, I don't just do science to protect the service member, I do that, but I also hope that it transcends and moves into the mainstream. So, and this type of platform technology that we're developing, it, you can use it for anything. So it, it's really a nice platform, and I think that you can, you can take that platform and apply it to multiple bugs. Steven. Yeah, for me, it's probably two reasons, personal and professional. And a personal reason um, is that it's, you know, it's a pretty significant public health concern in New Mexico. And when you've seen patients that are being treated 
Um, it's, it's, it kind of brings everything home and working with people at New Mexico, like Greg Mertz and others, just really, it's a nice way for a basic researcher like myself to work on something that could become translational. And when you're actually seeing patients, it really makes, focuses your work a lot. And professionally, there's, there's two reasons. One, this is just a great group of folks to work with and it's, and it's just been a lot of fun and I've learned so much. And then also when you're working on some of these viruses that I've kind of done through all my career, and I think a lot of you can speak to this too, very little is often known about them when you start. So it's frustrating because it's difficult to work with them, but at the same time, every day you're like, who knows what we might discover today? And so that also drives my interest in this project. Zachary. Yeah, I mean, just to continue to echo that sentiment of just the people, both at this table and in the room over there are just phenomenal to work with. Um, I mean, I could pick up the phone, call any of them any time of day and ask them questions and they'll get right back to me or pick up. I mean, it's, it's just such an incredible group of people to work with and everybody has uh, their individual talents all around this, the table in the room again that bring to the table to make this really complete scientific team, you know, from, from start to finish, right? All the way from, from blood to a product being manufactured. Like we have that ability in this room to do that. Um, and that's pretty, that's pretty special, I think. How about you in the audience? You like doing this? Really? I that's like some it? applause. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to add uh, one thing too, which is a couple of things. I think, um, one is that, I mean, first of all, it's an amazing group, and just the way we work together, it's like jazz improv. There's, you know, we talk a lot. We, you know, we're just sort of throwing the ball back and forth in a very seamless way. It's very open. It's very transparent, and that's very important, I think, for us as a group. Um, and we also, I think, we have, like, stakeholders from, like, you know, where the, the disease is important, I mean, from Chile and from Sweden. And so... You know, it's very important to us as a group that, you know, we're not just trying to make a product that we can sort of, you know, that is go then not going to be available. I mean, we want it to be available to the folks um, that where these diseases, the countries where these diseases are actually happening, and those folks are represented in our, in, in our consortium. So there's a sort of, a, I think it's a kind of a, a nice model of where we have academics, industry, people from industry, people from government all working together. Not just that, but also people from the U.S., from South America, from Sweden, you know, from Africa, that are all working together um, to hopefully not just say, hold hands and sing Kumbaya, but also make a product that, that's going to be really good, plus all of the, that's going to make a difference in public health, um, plus all of the research bounty that, that comes from this collaboration. But I also feel just like, you know, we, a number of us were already working together. I mean, I started my lab to be a basic virologist, but... Thanks to John and Zach and Laura, like we just kind of got into this much more translational space with Ebola first, which is incredibly satisfying, and we want to replicate this over and over again for as many different pathogens as we can work together on. So, all right, I have one more question for all of you. Actually, two. I asked you this already, but I'll ask you again. If you hadn't been a scientist, what would you have done? I don't know. Are, are you into the Myers Briggs thing? The so I'm an ENFP, which is like a weird type for a scientist. And the, the top profession on my list is interior decorator. Uh, <laughs> not sure I would have done that, but I think maybe I would have wanted to be a historian because I love, okay. I'm a history nerd. So. Zachary. Uh, I think I'd want to brew beer. I <laughs> like making beer. It's fun. Do you like drinking it too? I love drinking it too. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Steven. When I was a kid, I either wanted to be a rock star or a baseball player. Um, I don't have that much talent, so the rock star thing didn't work out. A uh, baseball player, I was a good fielder, but I couldn't hit or throw. So it's a good thing the science thing worked out, because honestly, I have no idea what else I'd be doing. All right. John. So growing up, I think I needed another six to eight inches because I wanted to be a basketball player. So I played basketball through high school, and then I reached my ceiling. <laughs> <laughs> Matthias. Yeah, I don't really know. I mean, the, the, I've had a, quite a few different jobs uh, in, my, in my long life. I would like to be a, maybe a professional surfer or something, <laughs> <laughs> be at the beach. I think that would be, I've never been that, just to let you know. But I think I, I, I'm, I'm really, I, I like being at the beach. I think okay. I, I would do that. Jason. 
I went to college for pre-med, uh, then got sort of uh, pulled away by science. So without that, I'd probably be in the medical field. Okay. Laura? I also have no idea, but I'll go with the medical field, medical too, probably. Field. Yeah. I think the, the beach is amusing in Sweden. <laughs> I was just at the beach, and it was bloody cold. I have to say. Cecilia, what would you be? Probably a photographer. Photographer? Yeah. I like nature, so yeah. We could work together. Yeah. yeah. Perfect. <laughs> Cecilia, RNA or DNA? RNA. Laura? DNA. Jason? Pretty much everything I work on is RNA. Matthias? DNA. John? RNA. Steven? RNA. Justin? Uh, Zachary, sorry. Yeah, RNA. Kartik? RNA. Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I'm on the fence. All right. DNA RNA hybrid? Is that that (laughs) loud? It's okay. All right. That's TWIV at Prometheus. You can find it on any podcast player. And at microbe.tv slash TWIV, where we keep all our show notes. If you like to send us questions and comments, twiv at microbe.tv. If you really like what we do, please consider supporting us financially. We do this on our own. We have very little support. So you can go over to microbe.tv slash contribute. We have ways like Patreon and PayPal where you could contribute a dollar a month if you did that. If all of you did that, it would really help us out. My guest today here at Prometheus, Kartik Chandran. Thank you, Kartik. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. And thanks for inviting us to do this. I think it was a good idea. Good way to spend an afternoon. Zachary Bornholt, thank you so much. Thank you. Stephen Bradfute, thank you. Thank you. John Dye, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Matthias Forsell, thank you so much. I like Tuck. 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 Yes. (laughs) Jason McClellan, thanks so much. You're welcome. Next time I'll be part of the three timers club. You will, you will. There's a next time. (laughs) Nice guy. Laura Walker, thank you so much. Thank you. And Cecilia Vial, thank you so much. Thank you, Vincent. I'm Vincent Racaniello. You can find me at virology.ws. I want to thank ASV and ASM for their support of TWIV, Ronald Jenkins for the music. This episode of TWIV was recorded, edited, and posted by Vincent Racaniello. You've been listening to This Week in Virology. Thanks for joining us. We'll be back next week. Another TWIV is viral. Thank you.